Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're connecting from. I'm Ira Feldman, the TinyML Foundation Managing Director, and I'd like to welcome you to today's hackathon finale for our pedestrian detection hackathon. Before we get started, I'd like to thank all the TinyML strategic partners who make this and all our other events possible, and most of them available free of charge. So when you have a moment, uh, please thank them, but uh, they make this all possible. So uh, extra special thanks. In terms of upcoming events, our next in-person event will be the TinyML Asia Technical Forum on Thursday, November 16th in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, registration is now open either uh, at the link below or the QR code. So if you're going to be in Korea or you know somebody in the region, uh, please invite them to join us. It'll be a great day of technical presentations and networking. I also would like to thank the judges who have worked hard on evaluating and setting up all the criteria for this event. Uh, we have Kwambi Agim from OpenMV, Yu Kitamura from Sony, Jesse Mintz Roth from the city of San Jose, Ho Nguyen from the city of San Jose, Ravi Sivalangam from Qualcomm, and David Tischler from Edge Impulse. And you'll be hearing from them as we go today. They'll be asking the contestants uh, questions. So we thank them for all their efforts and their insights. So before we uh, get into the actual uh, presentations, I'd like to ask Jesse to give us an overview of why we're doing this. Jesse? Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Jesse Mintz-Roth, and I'm joining from the city of San Jose, California. Um, and we uh, are, we, I am the head of the Vision Zero team. The Vision Zero team is located in the Department of Transportation, and we are tasked with uh, reducing the number of traffic fatalities and severe injuries that happen on the roadway. I have to say it's really exciting that the TDML Foundation took on this task for uh, this challenge because it is such an important topic. Um, and we're really excited to always work um, on this issue in many different ways, but also to work with the technology community. Um, in the United States, one of the major things that's happened in recent years is uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which created a grant program called Safe Streets for All, which has um, been an interesting uh, thing for many people in the private sector uh, to become involved in this area. So I think it's really exciting. Um, why don't we go to the next slide? Um, in the context in the US, this is national data, and this looks at pedestrian deaths in the last several decades. Uh, pedestrian deaths were falling. Um, until about 2009. And in 2009, they started going up very steeply again. And that is the context of the creation and adoption of Vision Zero programs all over the United States. Um, and that is also the context of how this program was started at the city of San Jose. Um, so uh, I think it's just very important to look at pedestrian safety specifically uh, in this context. Uh, the next slide. And so, um, you know, this is what it looks like when you're down on the street. And these are pictures from San Jose. Um, if you look at a big intersection, you can see that a lot of the places that we focus on are big wide streets. Um, and in the context of this view, pedestrians are pretty small. Um, but I think that the challenge of this is to be able to see the difference uh, with a camera between uh, the size of a person, the size of someone on a bike, and also a car, which are a little easier to see in this context. Um, and so um, I think one of the really important challenges also is that we're not just looking at people crossing in the crosswalk, we're also sort of noticing that people walk outside the crosswalk sometimes. And so that also just makes the challenge a little bit harder. Um, and also just to know that people also cross at night and it's harder to see at night. Um, so those are the big problem issues um, in this area, and we're looking forward to seeing uh, the contested presentations. Thank you, Jesse. In terms of prizes, so we're um, looking forward to award uh, $3,000 to the first place prize, 
uh, first place team, 2,000 to the second, and 1,000 to the third. And then we also want to thank Edge Impulse. They have a special award for the best use of Edge Impulse for $1,000. So we will be awarding those. And the awards will be announced on Thursday morning. We're going to have a short webinar, uh, less than an hour, 8 a.m. on Thursday morning. And we're very pleased that Matt Mahon, the mayor of San Jose, California, will be announcing the award winners. So uh, please uh, take a minute and sign up for the award ceremony. We'll also uh, send out an email to everybody with the link so that you can uh, sign up. But it'll be a separate uh, Zoom link for that. So that'll be Thursday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific. So we're very happy to announce the four finalist teams. We had Thunderbolt uh, cast from the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. We have Team NeuroOM from the Technical University of Applied Sciences, Nuremberg. We have Leopard Imaging and we have Okuli. So we'll hear from all four teams uh, this morning. Yu Kitamura from Sony will uh, provide us an overview on a vision technology. So you. Hi, uh, I'm Yu Kitamura uh, from Sony, uh, one of the judges uh, the, of today's Hackathon event. I was asked by the committee uh, to introduce the key technologies being proposed by the finalists today. All four teams uh, use the image sensor-based technologies. Um, some of them use the standard image sensors, RGB image sensor, and some of them use the uh, event-based image sensors, which is kind of like a new technologies in the market. So I'm going to introduce these basic characteristics of these uh, technologies, and I'm trying not to uh, explain it in uh, very matters is what it delivers in the end as a solutions. So I'm trying to focus on like pros and cons of these solutions. The, so let's go uh, to the explanations. So here, uh, the, there are different type of the image sensor technologies uh, available in the market. The one of the uh, group is the standard RGB image sensors, uh, which is used more than 95% of the imaging application in the world including the uh, factory automations, medical imaging, the uh, automatic driver's assistance, advanced driver's assistance, or surveillance, or a smartphone, they sell to cameras, all these consumer cameras. So that's one group. The second group is the, the green part, uh, which is uh, categorized as a special uh, sensor. So each type of the sensor has its very specialty uh, to detect something. For example, time of flight sensor can detect the distance to the object. Polarized sensors, uh, it can cancel the reflection in the image. Short wave IR, long wave IR, uh, this can see the, uh, the, the image uh, beyond uh, human eye can see. And then lastly, event-based sensor. Uh, this is uh, the uh, mainly used for the ultra speed applications. So uh, I'm going to explain uh, what this image, oh, sorry, event-based sensor uh, technology is. Let me uh, introduce in the short video clips. The human eye is designed to see change. The human optic nerve does not process everything that can be seen, yet is designed to perceive changes in brightness very effectively. It is based on how the optic nerve processes information and it records only the change in brightness. A new type of machine eye that realizes rapid and large scale information processing. That's Sony's EVS, event-based vision sensor. With an event-based vision sensor, how do we capture moving subjects? Let's take a look. With conventional frame-based sensors, all pixel information is recorded in each frame. On the other hand, an event-based vision sensor reacts to pixels with luminance change by the movement of the subject. 
recognizing the change as an event, coordinates, time, and light and dark polarities are combined as its output data for the reacting pixel. As a result, compared to frame-based sensors, Sony's event-based vision sensor can achieve high speed and high temporal resolution. It enables advanced data analysis that cannot be achieved under frame-based systems. So as you can see, uh, the event-based sensor focusing on the change. Only the uh, part of the uh, changed pixel uh, is uh, the triggered to capture the data. Uh, so uh, it can reduce uh, the data amount uh, much smaller, which can uh, support the faster uh, the time frame, uh, the temporal resolutions. So let's look at this, the uh, basic comparison uh, of this, the two technologies. Now, uh, we talk about the capturing speed, uh, the standard image sensors, it could be hundreds of the frame per second. Event-based sensor, uh, in contrast, it can achieve over 10K frame per second. It's very fast. The, that is because the, uh, it can only focus on the change, uh, which uh, reduce the size of the data being processed uh, in, the, in the sensors. Uh, and also the, all the relevant processing, uh, which can uh, accelerate the speed. In terms of the dynamic range, the uh, standard, uh, the camera, uh, the sometimes the, there is a challenge uh, to cope with the high dynamic uh, contrast image because all the pixel is controlled by the global one exposure control. Um, in comparison, the event-based sensors, the each pixel could detect the brightness change difference independently. So it doesn't need to rely on the uh, one global exposure control. Uh, so it can cope uh, with the uh, two bright part and two dark part uh, in the scene uh, easier. Next one is a non-motion object. Standard uh, image sensor can detect uh, no motion uh, object. Even base sensors, as it's explained, that it is focusing only the change, which means no motion object cannot be detected easily. So if the object is stopped, or if it's located far, and the uh, even it's moving the pixel uh, of the uh, the movement is small, it's very hard to be detected. Sudden illness change, the, uh, so standard image sensor, uh, the, uh, because of this, the uh, robust controls of these, the exposures and things, uh, to a certain degree, it's robust. Even based sensors, the, uh, basically uh, it generate a signal uh, based on the change. So the sudden illuminance change, such as the headlight, or the tree leaves, or flickering effect of the LED headlight, uh, the could cause the, a lot of the noise, which makes the uh, processing uh, very difficult. Market phase of these technologies, standard image sensor has been there for 50 years, so it's a commodity uh, product technology. Even best sensor is a very early stage of the technology introduction to the market, which is why the cost of this the, uh, technologies, standard image sensor is moderate, but even sensor uh, could be higher. Now, considering those the characteristics, the application uh, being used uh, for each sensor is, standard image sensor is uh, used for variety of the use case, including surveillance, machine vision, automotive, medical, those kind of things. Even based sensor uh, is used uh, more on the very specialty uh, use case. Uh, the, some of the use case which requires like a super high frame rate, um, such as the water droplets analysis, or the visual slam for robot and drone, 
uh, they can uh, the update this the uh, mapping uh, where this the robot and the drone is located, and then then they find a way to uh, go uh, automatically. So those kind of the slam is an another use case. And the uh, the last one is the uh, it tend to be used with other sensor as an assistant sensors. Even sensor is good at um, the uh, for the frame rate or dynamic range, uh, very very high performance. But sometimes uh, the it has some uh, difficulty uh, to detect some like a stationary object. So uh, people may use the other sensors uh, combined together. Uh, to overcome this challenge as a sense of fusion a solution. So that's the basic comparison of these the, uh, technologies. The uh, judge will score the points according to the judging criteria being published. Performance is the biggest part, so the accuracy of the model, power consumption, response time, that is the uh, high uh, portion of the score, 30 points. Second biggest part is the cost. So the bomb cost uh, is 20%, uh, sorry, 20 points. Installation uh, and maintenance uh, is also the 20 uh, points. So in total, 40 points for this, the, uh, the cost uh, related matters. I hope the finalist uh, explains those subjects well uh, to give the audience and judge clear understanding what your solution is. And the, uh, we'd like to hear how you benefit from the technology choices and also how you overcome the challenge of this technology. Thank you very much. Back to you, IR. Thank you, you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're delighted to present our pedestrian detection system. Our Thunderbolt team uh, members are Diego Silver, Ayan Shamarbay, me, Camilia Smagulova, Dr. Ahmed Al Sheikh, and our supervisor, Professor Ahmed Al Tawil. We are part of Communication and Computing System Lab at Kin Abdullah University of Science and, uh, and Technology. And uh, here's the outline of our presentation. First of all, uh, I will start with uh, some background information and then uh, introduce the proposed solution and the tools that we used. Then my colleague uh, Diego will continue with the data set that we created, model that was chosen and the results uh, and performance of the proposed system. In the end, I will be talking about installation and maintenance of the system. So, um, uh, with the growing number of traffic accidents, we got to know that in the U.S., pedestrian deaths formed the largest group of um, traffic fatalities in the road, and uh, it reached 17% in 2021. And we got to know about this Vision Zero uh, program from the Hackathon, which aims to substantially reduce traffic fatalities and severe injuries. And uh, one of the potential solutions uh, is to use uh, artificial intelligence assistant solutions and um, tiny machine learning models uh, in particular. We all know that tiny ML uh, models emerged as a powerful tool for accelerating machine learning models on resource constrained hardware uh, like uh, edge devices. And um, there is a need in cost-effective and accurate uh, prediction of detections on the road. And here's our proposed solution. It consists of two parts, like ho hardware part and software part. A hardware part is on the right-hand side. It consists of the uh, event-based camera that was introduced earlier. TV Explorer Lite uh, by Innovation. And the output of the processor is uh, processed by Akida Development Kit, which was kindly provided us by Brainchip uh, Company. Um, there are two approaches to deploy the uh, model uh, on this chip. The first one is a MetaTF framework, which is native to this Akida and which is typically used by machine learning experts. The other way is a third party uh, framework. Uh, which is um, like has a very intuitive interface and can be used by non-experts. In the following slides, I'll be stopping on this uh, on each of these components uh, one by one. 
Starting from the uh, camera that we chose, uh, earlier in the session, uh, it was already mentioned that um, it is human eye inspired and focuses only on the change in the event and does not process the redundant information about, about the background. Therefore, it has low requirements to the memory. Moreover, it has higher dynamic range than traditional cameras, which means that uh, we can capture that uh, data at low light illuminations and uh, very bright scenes, uh, for example, at night or uh, when the uh, at very sunny days. And uh, these cameras uh, typically has a uh, faster response in the order of microseconds and a low power consumption orders of milliwatts. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see uh, the uh, uh, framework uh, captured by uh, Div Explorer Lite uh, in our uh, solution. And uh, on the bottom, uh, you can see the uh, corresponding frame-based picture. And we believe that the output of such uh, event uh, cameras uh, better to be processed by special temporal architectures like spiking neural networks and spiking neural networks, uh, human brain inspired architectures. Uh, they are dynamic and event driven and uh, they have high sparsity, which benefits in low memory requirements and low power consumption. Moreover, they're faster and uh, re uh, resilient to the noise uh, compared to the traditional neural networks. And uh, we found that uh, we find that uh, one of the best uh, hardware platforms to uh, accelerate SNNs is uh, uh, Akida uh, brain chip. We have uh, Akida version one uh, with Raspberry Pi. Uh, the what is beneficial about this uh, hardware platform that it uh, processes data in event domain as spiking neural networks. It has multiple cores, uh, like with 1.2 million neurons and 10 billion of synapses. And these cores can um, work in parallel and process uh, workloads in distributed manner. Uh, moreover, it has uh, special tools to convert the traditional NNs to spiking neural networks. And it has quantization tool to uh, lower the bit and uh, benefit in um, better uh, power efficiency. And most importantly, it has on-chip learning, which allows us um, tuning uh, the model uh, without uh, accessing the cloud uh, uh, right away at the edge of this platform. And moving to the software part, as I mentioned, we had uh, we used uh, two tools. The first one is MetaTF framework. It has four uh, Python packages. The first package allows us to develop as our uh, Akida model without access to the hardware. Uh, other two uh, tools uh, allows us to convert uh, convolutional neural networks into spiking neural networks and uh, quantize the model. And um, there is a Akida model zoo, which has already uh, pre-created network models that are already quantized and um, converted into the spikes. The next framework, uh, which is alternative to MetaTF, um, it, it's a edge impulse. It's an end-to-end pipeline. Here we can create uh, own data set and label it here, or we can load the data set that was pre-created with labels. And uh, also there are options of creating own model. We can also choose the models that are already embedded into the, this uh, platform. Uh, we can do the training and testing in Edge Impulse 2 and deploy the model on different types of hardware, including Akita brain chip. And the next part will be continued by my colleague, uh, Diego. Please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diego. And here I'll be explaining about the data sets that we use it in this model. And we have two data sets. The first one is a data set based on real world event data. And our goal here was considering what we already have on the literature of event based data, what we can use for our purpose. And we had two first goals here. First, we need detection of pedestrians and if available, also two wheelers. Second, we need to have a huge variety in terms of weather conditions and illumination conditions. And searching in the literature, we found the first data set of our interest, which prophesies one megapixel. 
it focused on automotive scenarios. It has three classes. It has two wheelers, pedestrians, and cars. And the resolution is one megapixel. It has up to 25 million of labels, and it was recorded in France. In different parts of the year, considering different illumination conditions and different weather conditions. And when we look at the table on the left, we have the distribution of the classes in this data set. It has 6 million pedestrians, 16 million cars, and 1 million of two-wheelers. However, it brings us a problem because we see that we have a huge class imbalance here. And it's not good for our case because it will make the model, machine learning model, tends towards the more represented class. And also, when we look at this gray image here at the bottom, we see some predictions made by this model. And we can see that we have the pedestrians in blue boxes and we have a certain pattern here. As it was recorded from inside a car, the pedestrians are always on the side, which is the point of view of a car. And we are interested in a better vari variability in terms of pedestrians because it's the most sensitive class we have here. Then we started to look into a new data set that was launched recently, which is Pedro. It's focused on robotics and it has only one class, which is pedestrian, recorded in a 346 by 260 camera, having 40,000 labels and recorded in Italy, also considering different seasons of the year, illumination conditions and weather conditions. And we can see here in black some images from Pedro, and you can see that we have a better distribution of pedestrians in the middle, in the bottom middle. And that made us to decide that Pedro, it's the best representative of pedestrian to us. Then we use it, it as a baseline. And you merge it to it some two-wheelers from prophecies on megapixel. And we did it in an amount of samples that could make this data set balanced. And the second step is the use of synthetic even data for cross-road recordings. Why we are using this synthetic data? Firstly, we notice that in the data sets from the literature, we have a pattern that the camera is moving in the scene. However, when we go to the record of the crossroads monitoring, we see that the camera is static all the time and the objects are moving. That's the first point. And the second point, we don't have data sets focused on this kind of task. Then we use it of the property that events react to what is moving to create new data. And what we did, we selected some videos from internet that has crossroads. And if an object moves in front of the event-based camera, it will produce events. Even if this object is inside a video, then it's a powerful tool to generate new event data based on RGB data that we already have. And it was already proven in literature that models trained on synthetic data generalizes well for real event data. Then we selected this video, put the camera in front of it, collected events from that. Then we converted the events to a frame-like representation for labeling purposes, apply some filtering to remove the background noise, and we upload all this data into Edge Impulse, which has a really resourceful and intuitive tool for dealing with data set in general. It, and we use it to label our data and to analyze some features. And basically, in summary, we have the Hero Genius dataset from real world event data made of one megapixel and Pedro and the synthetic dataset. All the data were downsampled to the resolution of 224 by 224. As we can see here in the table for the Hero Genius dataset, we have a balanced number of pedestrians and two wheelers. And for the synthetic dataset, we have 106 pedestrians, 231 two wheelers, 730 cars, because we also added cars. We wanted to see how well it could identify pedestrians, even with cars involved. And talking about the model, we first started with the baseline model, which is AkidaNet Yolo V2 from Akida Zoo model and using some uh, already made packages from Edge Impulse GitHub, which accelerates the usage of such tools. And the Akida net is basically a neural network optimized for Akida devices, while YOLO v2 comes from you only look once, one of the most popular families of object detectors. 
And we have this following structure on our model. We have a backbone, Akida.net, 0.5. 0.5 stands for the kind of scaling using in the model. Then IOLO V2 detection hat is placed in front of it. It's basically a sequence of convolutions stacked at each other, which give us classes and boxes predictions as a result. And our target here is to start from this baseline model and from that obtain a quantized spiking model that can run on Akida. And we can do it by three steps. The first is we train our AkidaNet YOLO V2 baseline. And using the quantization aware training available on Brainchip resources, we receive an intermediate model. We call it here I8A4W4. It stands for 8-bit input, 4-bit activation, and 4-bit weight. And the final step is to map this quantized model to cells that can be used inside the Akida device. And also, we wanted to check how good our model is performing. Then we decided to use the most advanced, advanced version of the YOLO family, the YOLO V8, as a reference. We would like to implement it on Akida device. Unfortunately, it has some structures that are still not available on the device, which will be changing in the future. And the YOLO V2 is, from the YOLO family, the most advanced model that can fit the constraints of Akida model. And our model pipeline basically consists on those five steps. We have the data collection, we, which in our case was a heterogeneous in the synthetic data set. Then you go to some image data preprocessing, especially in the case of the synthetic data where we needed to apply some filtering. Then we did the Keras model training using an IBEX cluster. And using MetaTF, we did all the quantization and conversion process to finally deploy it for inference. And here is our inference framework, the pedestrian detection framework. We have the input, which can be a live stream from the event-based camera, or you can just upload recordings in a that for data and send it to the application. And the application has two models. First is the capture, where we capture the events and convert them to frames. Then those frames are sent to the inference where in our case, it's running YOLO V2 Akida model, but it can run any other pre-trained model that's compatible with Akida, like FOMO. And finally, we output the result using web interface with the library Flask. And here we can see an example of how this prediction works. Uh, were to mention that noise filtering was applied to this data where sequences of events shorter than one MS were removed for suppressing noise background. And then when we go to the results, the metric we are using here is the mean average preci precision at an intersection of over, over a union of 0 0.5. Look at this photo of this stop sign. What the mean average precision give us is a metric to measure, given a certain prediction, how good the box that my model predicts matches the ground truth given a certain threshold, in this case 0 0.4. And first, to check the performance of our model, we started with the heterogeneous data set. And firstly, we trained it on YOLO V8N using PyTorch library. And then here we have the results that we trained it on Keras for all the three models generated on all the three steps of the brain chip training. First, when you look at the MAP, comparing the AkidaNet baseline, the intermediate quantized model and the final converted model, we can see that the MAP didn't change at all, which means that the steps of quantization and mapping doesn't bring any degradation of the model. Also, we see that the model is really good for the technical pedestrians, 77 and 76, but it's not good at all for two wheelers with an MAP of 15. And when you compare it with YOLO V8, we see that uh, we use the YOLO V8 Nano, which has similar size than YOLO V2. And we see that the difference in MAP is around 20, driven especially by two eaters, which has a difference of 30, while the pedestrians, the difference is only for 13. Those differences are good when we consider that YOLO V8 is a really advanced model. It has multiple detection heads. It has multiple scale feature fusion, features that we don't have in YOLO V2. And explaining the difference in terms of two eaters and how two eaters were too bad, it can be explained by the fact that it was originally a one megapixel data set reduced to 2024 resolution. And 
in a model that doesn't have too much uh, detection heads, it cannot be detected that goodly by it. And then as we compared our model with a good benchmark and evaluated that it has good performance, we move it to the synthetic data set where we repeated the training steps again for the Akida models. And we can see here that we had a increase in terms of MVP from 67 to 72 to the final model. And with a difference of four points in pedestrians, six points, eight points, and eight points for two wheelers and three points for cars. Uh, the presence of noisy on event sensors that are naturally carrying some noise and the fact of this noise being unstructured and high frequency was reported as a reason in some papers by some quantized models achieving better performance than the original models. And when we analyze in terms of hardware, first we can see here a video showing how the prediction of our model would look like. And when we analyze the final model parameters, we have 483 million of max, a sparsity of 83%, a model size of 4.2 megabytes. And analyzing the output of Akida, we can see that the power consumption was not higher than 66 milliwatts. The response time was not higher than 138 milliseconds. And considering the conditions on where those inferences are made and analyzing the technical details of the camera, we can infer that the power consumption was not higher than 140 milliwatts and the response time was bounded to one millisecond. And now I would like to give the word again to my colleague Camilla to explain about installation and maintenance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diego. And moving to installation and uh, maintenance, uh, in the beginning of this hackathon, we were uh, given some specifications how this system should be installed. And the first one, uh, uh, since our uh, more, uh, system was uh, trained for different weather and uh, lightning conditions, so we believe that uh, we fulfilled the first uh, item, then the system should be operational up uh, temperatures up to 65 degrees, but um, uh, our kida can operate 24 for seven uh, at uh, degree uh, the temperatures up to 50 Celsius degree. Uh, moreover, the system will be uh, mounted on a pole uh, at height uh, between 50 to 30 feet from the ground. And um, uh, it should, uh, the field of view should cover 70 feet wide road with up to four lines. And we estimated that we, if we will be using four Div Explorer uh, light cameras, we need to set the focal lens to 4.5 uh, millimeters. And this will allow uh, and uh, the uh, distance between the uh, target object and the camera should be also like uh, uh, five meters away. Also, there is a requirement about uh, typical illumination, which is uh, 3,300 lumen. And uh, after some estimations of the area, we estimate that it should be uh, six, 7,000 lux, which is uh, within the range of uh, dynamic range of the camera. And the rest of the requirements uh, uh, regarding uh, power, communication, and relay contact are fulfilled as well. And uh, we believe that maintenance should be uh, like regular. Uh, reg the system should be tested regularly and um, calibrated. Uh, there is a, a need to clean, uh, clean the lenses, inspect the cables and connections, and check the power supply at a certain fre frequency. And to sum up, uh, we would like to highlight what was done within this uh, 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 scope of this hackathon. Uh, first of all, we created the balance event-based uh, uh, data set uh, using uh, one megapixel and Pedro data sets. Uh, also, we are uh, proposing the fully neuromorphic solution uh, that was inspired by uh, human eye and human brain for pedestrian detection that was operating on Akita brain chip. And uh, we would like uh, to thank organizers of this hackathon, City of San Jose and TinyML Foundation. Also, sincere thanks go to BrainChip team for providing us the uh, development kit and for the training sessions that uh, they provided to us and the, all the materials. We also would like to thank uh, our Edge uh, Impulse uh, framework. And here's the, our team. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, we're gonna, some of the judges like to ask some questions, um, and then we have some audience questions. Yes. Hi, this is Ravi. I had a question about how well you think event sensors work in adverse weather conditions like rain. I know we don't get a lot of snow in San Jose, but uh, in, in conditions of rain or when like the sun is on the horizon and there's some glare um, in typical cameras, how well does the event camera work here? Have you tested that in such scenarios? Well, we didn't test in those scenarios, but for example, the data sets we are using, they contemplate some of those, of those scenarios. For example, Pedro, they have samples on snowy ways. And even though we could get a good performance when doing the predictions, and it was also reported on, even on pools that convert video to events, that events are good for reconstructing uh, high speed images, high images with blur and et cetera. Then from what we analyze it from the data sets we are using and from literature, yes, we believe that they can perform well in such conditions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so um, my name is Hongwei, I'm with the city of San Jose. So I'm more of the end user and since this camera is going to be installed uh, in a static position, um, you're going to have a lot of objects that don't move, right? Um, cars that are parked on the side of the street. Sometimes it's nice to understand the context of that scene and knowing that there are cars parked on the side of the street is important. Would you think that using these event-based cameras, um, you wouldn't be able to see those cars or those parked objects? or even pedestrians that momentarily stop or cars that momentarily stop for pedestrians. Would that be somewhat of an issue? Well, uh, yes, the event-based cameras has those limitations. If you don't have change of brightness, the sensor is blind. Mm -hmm. However, uh, it was out of our scope and out of our time here, but they can be employed together with uh, RGB images, for example, where each one cover the weakness of each other. For example, the event-based cameras can cover for high blur, high dynamic range, and high speed parts of scene, while the RGB can cover for this better scene understanding. Okay, okay, all right, fair enough. Um, the other slide, you showed the range of the camera, and it showed, was, was that distance is 16 feet? Was that correct? Mm, uh, no, uh, it's... Sorry. Yeah. The, the, is that for distance, the distance, distance from the yeah. camera? From the camera, right. Okay, 16 feet is really, really short. I mean, we're, this is for field application. So we're talking about, you know, um, looking uh, at four lanes this, of travel. Yeah, this could be adjusted by uh, setting up the uh, larger focal length. Okay, all right, good. And then last question that I think you didn't really cover too much is the cost. Um, how much it would a, a system like this cost if it were to go into production and things like that? Um, the camera is around uh, 2,500 US dollars and uh, uh, the Akida uh, chip costs around $5,000 uh, based on Raspberry Pi, according to the like information. Okay. Okay. I mean, I like the idea that's low powered costs that high cost seems to be a bit of a concern for me. If I were to install, you know, a thousand of these pieces out on the streets if you're in San Jose, um, we're talking about millions of dollars there. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the judges? Um, actually, let me, let me go into some from the audience. Um, how did you, there, the question was, how did you arrive? And I, I think you talked about this a little bit, but YOLO V2 on Akita Net. Um, why did you, you know, how, how did you home in on this as a model or select this model? Well, uh, the Akita device, it has some constraints. For example, the current state of the technology doesn't allow the use of residual, residual connections, concatenations, multiple detection heads, and parallel operations in general. Then we needed to search for models that can give us good performance at the same time that they don't have 
features that won't fit on Akida. And for example, when you, we analyze the multiple detection heads, from Yolo v3, we start to have multiple detection heads. Then Yolo v3 should not be feasible for that. Then the Yolo v2 head is the most advanced detection head that we can fit now from the Yolo family. And the rest of the, the work was to analyze different backbones. And from all the backbones we analyze it, Akida Net seemed to be the best one in terms of performance. And as well, it was something really well documented for from brain chip, well tested, then okay, this is a good choice for the backbone. And Yolo V2 from Yolo family is the most advanced that we can use it in the current state of that technology. Okay, good, thank you. And I think you already addressed the other one about um, different weather conditions. It was you know, based upon what was in the data set. So I think you've addressed that. Okay, thank you very much. And hey, you are I'm sorry, I, um, I have a general question. I, I noticed a lot of these presentations use a very common term that I'm not familiar with them in my industry. It's called um, the MAP. Um, what What is that? I, I know do, it, do, it's a... Do, so the, the, you want to, guys, you want to bring your slide back up and just explain MAP one more time, please? For example, when we do predictions for object detection, we predict the classes, but we also Sorry. <laughs> predicted the boxes. Then we we'll have the we have the detections here, and we have the boxes, and we establish a certain threshold. For example, here is zero point five, which means, roughly speaking, that we have an overlap between the correct box and the ground truth box at the factor of zero point five. And we want those boxes to be as closer as possible of the ground truth. And the mean average precision for all the classes will summarize how well those box predictions are being did, done, basically. Then it's related to the geometry and how it's doing all the classes and to a specific parameter that you want. For example, I want a 0 0.7. Then you calculate all the box matchings check if they have a 0 0.7 overlap and the MAP at the end will be the result that will summarize everything for your detections. So with the MAP number, the higher the number, the the more close you are to the actual? Yes. Uh, okay. It will average for all your predictions and all your classes, how good you match the predicted boxes with the mm -hmm. ground truth boxes for a given threshold. In this I case, we use 0 0.5. Okay, so 100 is the highest? Yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, good. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, our team next neuron. team up is, a, yes, Team Neuron. Yes. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Ira. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. So greetings from Germany, Nuremberg. Uh, we're going to introduce our idea for a solution, a named spider, basically looking at spiking perception processing for the detection of pedestrian and urban roads. We are, uh, we are a team of students and faculty from Nuremberg. You have here a, like a screen, like a QR code from our lab if you want to check it out. And also, if you have time right now to zoom it in, the project demo report and data sets we released with our, our work. So they will be repeated on multiple slides, so you have time to take it out. So we chose to go on a spiking approach. We again use the event-based camera, but we'll tech, tackle the problem in a a la tiny ML fashion, really going away from all the redundancy and trying to put in the focus, yeah, robust detection. We're going to look at the goal of our project and basically why we selected out of the goal of this challenge, our solution overview, how we develop it in life cycle, the sensing and the models, the algorithmics, and then we delve in the performance evaluation. We'll look at the accuracy of the, of the solution, the deployment and the power budget, the bill of materials and the cost, and of course, what we deliver with the whole solution. Well, the goal was to provide a solution for Vision Zero. Um, we learned all about Vision Zero. I was pretty impressed reading about it at, 
uh, Germany even uh, implemented it and it got like in like, I don't know, 10 years, like 45% reduction of, of, of fatalities. Pretty impressive. So it's like, we have to do this as well. And what we got out of the goal is that we have to have a cost-effective, accurate solution to detect pedestrians day and night, but with a good energy footprint, robustness, and budget. Um, so these are our like main ingredients or like what motivated us to come up with this solution. And right now I'll just delve into it. Yeah. So without further ado, we go to the solution overview. So as mentioned in the title, we'll look at uh, spiking perception. We again use event-based cameras. So this like change in paradigm from frame-based. So we only look at changes in luminance and how this changes carry information about what happens in the environment. And basically what we do like right now is to, to, to have two deployments. So we actually were pretty creative. We said, okay, we're going to do spiking processing, but we want to do it also at a tiny ML, which is not necessarily always neural networks and stuff. Yeah. So we have one branch who looks at the spike neural network development where we got our own data sets. We actually acquired multiple data sets and we used edge impulse Fantastic, fantastic tool, by the way, to train the models and then deploy on the BrainChip Akita. Thanks to BrainChip for offering that. And the second part, we actually went on a on a on a different uh, direction where we developed a novel algorithm, an event-based expectation maximization, which runs not on the BrainChip Akita board but on the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, and we all see at the end what the difference is and how this actually comes together. And again, thanks Brainship for the board and Frank's uh, KTH Stockholm for the sensor. Although this was like the, the board we developed, it's a custom DVS camera developed in my previous research lab. When we look at the functional architecture, well, basically what happens here is that we have a, we, we split everything in a modular fashion. We have a data acquisition module based basically on this DVS camera. It's itself a board, but it has some nice features that also like were presented by our uh, previous uh, competitors. And the cool part with it was that we were able to get this data and pre-process it. First, load it in, in the edge impulse for the spiking neural network development. But in this case, we aggregated events. So we were not able to fit single raw events, but we aggregated like our competitors as well. We looked at uh, 30 millisecond aggregation windows. But on the second deployment, which we're pretty proud of, is the expectation maximization, which is purely event-based. So basically each pixel contributes to the expectation or to the likelihood estimation that the algorithm does to detect is a pedestrian or a bike. Yeah, so keep in mind, we have two deployments or two okay, kind of two possibilities for the deployment and we'll follow in a second with both sides being described and um, like evaluated. For the development life cycle, basically we used Edge Impulse, pretty neat tool. I, I was pretty reluctant at the beginning because like I will work myself a lot in ML and like I usually hate cloud tools, but this actually came really handy, especially when playing the app with uh, events and aggregation and trying to find features which are useful for training our models to, de to develop in spike in neural network and brain chip, but also helping in crafting features for the expectation maximization, basically to understand how to fuse in the physics of a pedestrian. Yeah. So I just give right now a small overview here how a, the whole pipeline is. So the data science part, this was uh, like excellent for us. We're able to upload the image data from our DBS camera to have a, a brain chip Akita um, tuned model that we're able to test and, and deploy and then playing around with, with raw features from the actual data we got. So overall, pretty nice experience. And what we actually used was the Akita faster objects, more objects. It's a mobile net V2 that we actually used in one side of our project. And we're going to see in a second how this actually looks in, in practice. Well, coming back to the approach, we said we have spiking perception and processing. So the sensing part, we already discussed, we saw it from Sony. 
it's not only Sony selling the sensor. There are multiple vendors. I uh, actually got a, the, the sensing chip ourselves and we built a board around it. And uh, we got the same features out, but what was like handier was just this board actually was available and we had it in my, I had it in my desk so I could use it for the hackathon. And the cool part is that we actually acquired it ourselves. So we came up with three data sets in Nuremberg and one in Munich. So two at daytime, one in a crowded intersection. The second one looks at uh, a lot more like size three. We have like multiple lanes and there are pedestrians around and no uh, pedestrian across. Whereas in the first one, we have a pedestrian cross and a nighttime data set. Yeah, where we took advantage of course of um, a street light. Yeah, I will not go into details of the of the event based camera. We also we only get what changes and we don't get redundant frames. Well, this is what you we get a feeling. So this is basically our ground through. So all our recordings are also in the data set. We want to download it. We have ground through and we have the event uh, data next to it. So this is just for you to get a feeling about the type of data we acquired and uh, how the event representation looks like. Well, when coming to algorithmics, basically we use the default model of, uh, of Edge Impulse, the FOMO, which is a mobile net V2 ConvNet. And then we actually tweaked here and there on the features side, because we actually look at events we aggregated. Unfortunately, we lost this beautiful feature of the DVS of the event-based camera to have like event streams, but we aggregated for like 30 milliseconds or 35 frames per second features, looking at density of events attached to body segments. This is something you have to keep in mind because we try to do the detection based on the body segments. So we look at pedestrians as made of like three segments, and then we try to figure out how we can get features based on the density of events in normal motion and how to embed that in the mobile net. And then we build these heat maps, which actually helped us in, in building and crafting this, this, uh, uh, these filters, these complayers, which were uh, used then to detect pedestrian versus bike. And the cool part is that this mobile net is then like compiled in a spiking neural network in Edge Impulse. So top job guys, we then use this model directly on the Akita board. And this is a short demo demonstrating the Akita functionality. So basically this is the, the comp net you've seen running on the Akita board. You just make sure like we're on the same page. So we have this running on the, uh, on the Akita board, and then the output was 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 split, like was spit out on a in a web interface. What you see here, of course, we have like we as mentioned, we had body segments. So basically, what we had will have like multiple points detected, like basically two points detecting the pedestrians because they're like based on three segments. So the two points will detect the pedestrian. Of course, there are errors. Of course, we have this limitation of like twenty minutes training for engine. Oh, sorry, guys. You have to give more for the free users. And what we got there and what you see here is like basically uh, like a core of, uh, so it's like 25 milliseconds inference and the amount of power used by the system as calculated on the branch was pretty, pretty, pretty small. You'll see more about power consumption and set. Well, the second path looked more in a, as I said, a la tiny ML, approach. Basically, we said, okay, let's trip away all the neural networks and let's just try it using, again, machine learning, but directly on the microcontroller. So the event-based expectation maximization is the creative part of our problem or our solution, sorry. And basically, it uses single events to get estimates about if this event belongs to one of the three segments characterizing a pedestrian or a biker, and then Basically, in 500 lines of C code, you have this running on the Raspberry Pi. Um, so I will not go too much into details right now. So people like interested in the details, I have here a lot of backup uh, backup notes. So happy to talk at the end. But keep in mind, machine learning running directly on the microcontroller. This was important. And you'll see later in the power budget, this pays off. And again, this is a demo with the event-based maximization. So basically this is the input data we have. Like again, this is the ground truth because we have the camera mounted next to the GPS camera to capture a bit also what happens. And also regarding the question before, yeah, you might need a cheap camera next to you to understand context. 
And what you see here is the tool we de develop to implement this expectation maximization is a C code running directly on the Akida microcontroller. And basically what you have there is the, the DVS viewer and then the, the, the camera viewer and the tracker, uh, uh, like the tracker, the um, pedestrian tracker or the biker tracker. And then you have their colored events basically showing which color or like which part of the sec or which segment of the body you're actually tracking. And um, basically what's interesting right now to note is that we focused on this solution. There was a small bug right now, the inverse, like the image will be like rotated, but like, you actually see the color coloring of the event. So we belonging to the upper part, the middle part and the lower part, like the legs. And we choose this approach to be able to take between kids and like, uh, taller persons or uh, adults, and I have like multiple bikers and so on. And interestingly enough, when you look at performance, well, we'll look at the spike neural network because the edge impulse has a really nice model, which is pretty well tuned and uh, pretty well put in place. We didn't have too much to do, so we actually got three good quantitative evaluations. So we got like in the detection rates, like background, okay, we discard that like 87% bicyclist and 93% pedestrian accuracy. So like we're, we're pretty happy with like this out of the box and little tuning based on the, on this feature uh, building. And on the qualitative evaluation, as you also saw before in the, in the demo, we were able to distinguish between pedestrians and, and bikers. So like the task was there. If we have more time to spend in tuning and fine tuning, yeah, maybe we'll get better results. But this was pretty impressive for us as well, that fact that we played a bit with the DDS data, we fed it in the model, finely tuned, and then that this comes out like really nicely running on the Akita board. On the other side, on the event-based expectation maximization, we didn't get so much like so amazing results. We got like 84% accuracy and 83% uh, pedestrian accuracy. So bicyclist and pedestrian. And the, the like again, it's all about model tuning. And we want to spend time in actually getting these expectation maximization, this ML model, like actually working on a microcontroller instead of actually having like amazing performance. Because if we end up like doing this project. Or like putting it in place and deploying it, we have time to tune parameters, so this is fine. I would say like we're pretty impressed the fact that we're able to put this running on the Raspberry Pi, and the fact it was online learning, yeah. So this is for us something which might actually raise to the bar of fulfilling the objectives of the of the hackathon. When it comes to the deployment, this was very pretty neat experiment. So we actually made many experiments. We just put here on the slide just a couple looking at basically the, the the deployment and the power it drew. So we look at the, um, sorry. So we look at the Raspberry Pi event-based expectation maximization AML. So we got like around four watts, so like around like five watts. And for that Kida spike neural network, we actually got like around 7.5 watts. Yeah, again, input was based on events. Right now for the in-lab lab test, we actually have a, a screen in front of the camera. Yeah, because we couldn't actually test the whole thing in the street. But we have the screen projecting the ground truth we actually saw like saw before. And then the camera you see here, the input, like the, the output of the camera, which was sent to the rest, to the Akita board. Yeah? So these are our power measurements. We also looked at power loss. If this like the board works, even if you go up to like uh, five volt because basically you have like DC DC converters there you have magic and everything looks good so like for deployment perspective like a pragmatic view this works well but even more interesting what we've done is the weatherization so we actually have the uh, uh, an oven and we put a camera in up to 65 Celsius degrees Celsius and we test it again so right now instead of like projecting some events we actually put the camera to look at the fan of the of the spinning fan of the oven. So basically we got a lot of events coming out and we're able to test this event injection in the algorithm. And at the same time looking at, okay, we have 65 degrees Celsius. Like we, we passed the test of having the working system in a pretty hot environment. Yeah. Um, now finalizing the, the, the whole tech talk, we look at the bill of materials and costs. And happy to say that we have two options. So we either go for the, let's say, worst price 
uh, option will be like around three thousand dollars. I know San Jose doesn't like that, especially when on a scale. We don't do that. This is the same set or like similar sensor like all the uh, competitors before used. Or what we can buy is a Samsung sensor. Sorry, Sony, Samsung has like a cheap version. So Samsung sells the smart things vision sensor right now available in the Netherlands for like around 58 euros without taxes. So you can go a best price solution for around $226. Given that, given that, right now, if we look at the brain chip Akira, well, it's not necessarily 5,000 euros. Yeah? If you look at the overall components and you just buy them separately, you get lower with the price. So I would say if you get like $100 for the Akira chip, $50 for the Raspberry Pi, $50 for a DBS camera, and a $26 for like a five meter long USB cable with a signal amplifier, we get there. Um, and now to wrap up, our deliverables, it's something we give back to the community as well. So we have some data set released, like in three locations, like pretty nicely described there on the left side. We have a code release, basically a, a code, like a model in Edge Impulse and another one running on microcontroller. Both available for the for the judges were available from the submission time. And a solution release, because we also played around with the minimal energy footprint and the measurements we've done and a physical deployment. Actually, these are my this is my team and myself like recording data on the street. And now to wrap up, I would like to say that Spider, it is a tiny ML solution for supporting hopefully Vision Zero pedestrian detection. And it uses low power neuromorphic sensing and processing. And I've made some back of the emperor of calculation. It's pretty funny because when we look at the branch of Akita with the DVS, we get like four watt to seven watt. We actually saw it in our experiments. Whereas in the typical system, we have like specialized cameras with GPUs to do all these fancy big learning thingies at around 400 watt. Yeah, for like high speed cameras and robust cameras. But like the thing is, if we look at, again, back of the envelope, large scale, 100 million devices sold. And we say like, we get 100 full power reduction. Yeah, because instead of having like, um, like this um, uh, seven watt, we get like 400 watt, and then you suddenly end up having, if you have only camera, traditional cameras and GPUs behind, you get around like 40 gigawatt. Yeah, so like, I will go for the chip solution here. Yeah. Then another point is that we only employ local processing. So basically at the edge, once you even like got your uh, edge impulse model, it's run there or like our ML model, which runs on the microcontroller, the on-site processing data reduces the transmitted data out. So like from 320 megabytes per second, let's say in like a normal system with a camera based approach to 300 bytes per second. So it's like 10,000 times less data. Because we look at considering 25 bytes per object, eight per time, 16 per coordinates, one for the class you have, and then basically you end up to 300 bytes. And provides a good accuracy. I didn't put overwhelming accuracy at the moment because we didn't do so much fine tuning, but we get robust visual detection under varying condition. With this, I'm done and open for questions. Thank you, Christian. Um, let's see, let's start with the judges. What are the judges' questions? Hi, um, I have some questions. Yes, um, sure. The it's uh, you from Sony here. Uh, so you show some video at the beginning, uh, going back um, the uh, something on the street, and yeah, I just like to confirm the how you handle this stopped object. I think this is the red lady. The lady stops. Yeah, yeah stops. the lady stops. Um, well, she stops. So she basically doesn't jump on the street. Basically, you don't need that information anyway in your model. Yeah. Again, what 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 interesting is that in this case is a signalized intersection. So the pedestrian comes, but then she stops. Um, why would a stop okay, so, person at the stop yeah. like be informative for the pedestrian detection algorithm just like in safety reasons, for example? Okay, so basically it stopped and it doesn't detect. Okay. Uh, next question is the the in terms of the cost, the one you share is basically the I think I, as a total system is an indoor base 
camera here. Yeah. So uh, the to make it weatherize for the outdoor real installation, you need to uh, add some more to this bomb and then cost, correct? Good, good, good point. So basically, I could use the sensor I shown you in my experiments, which is the weatherized version of it, and it will be like the same around the same cost. But it's a custom board, uh, custom board. So my lab, we got the sensors and we made the boards ourselves, the whole design and the whole architecture to get events up. But we get around like 50 euros as well. But I didn't want to put my sensor on because we have a limited quantity of it. But we actually, I have put the, the Samsung version, which again, as you mentioned, it's not weatherized for indoor use, for person detection indoor. But I just wanted to get people a feeling where are the, 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 the bounds. Um, and because gotcha. it's possible. Yeah? So even like if we go for a custom design, we, we it's possible. We don't have to buy the, the innovation or the prophecy or the Sony system. Yeah? If we can yeah, board, definitely. build, board ourselves. Thank you. So the, uh, you just need to add this outdoor housings and those kind of things. The same thing for the power consumption, right? I think that normally it's the biggest part of the power consumption is this outdoorized solutions, the heaters and blow and those kind of things. But that doesn't include in this power consumption here. As I said, basically, even the brain chip Akita board had a small fan, which was anyway connected at the moment of measurement. So I don't know how much power it dissipates, like the, the brain chip Akita. I didn't do any like power measurements of like, or like heating measurements of the board itself. I think brain chip has more knowledge about that. But in their data sheet, they mentioned it's pretty rugged. Yeah, so it's a rugged uh, board. Yeah. So I would trust what they say. Yeah, and you saw, we put it in the oven ourselves. So let's see. Gotcha, thank you. So just need to add this the power consumption of this outdoorized part on top of that you share, gotcha. It, yeah, but like basically measure power, all, like it's pretty hard to measure power when you have it in the oven, as you imagine. But like, yeah, so it's a good, fair point. Fabena, please. Um, I have a question. Um, oh. So um in your video with that where where that woman stopped um yeah. uh, yes you know um it's probably you know she stopped on the sidewalk so, so therefore it's not too much of concern but you know we also see a lot of um elderly um the elderly uh, old people crossing the street and they cross at a very very you know slow rate um would that be a concern well yeah, like what if I would say, not, 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 not necessarily. So right now it's even like interesting because we opted for a really low resolution camera in this case. Yeah, so you see it's mounted like around two or three meters away from the street, and it was like really like VGA camera. Yeah, so really low resolution. When you get like a high resolution camera with the price of having more events, you'll be able to also detect like with the high resolution small changes, and you can even tune the 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 sensitivity of the system to actually even for slow motion to detect the changes so it's a matter of bias tuning of the of the of the dvs camera i played myself a lot to mm -hmm. be able to actually do psychophysical experiments with slow mo moving objects and it's doable so it's again it's a tuning matter of the camera but you could do that even for like slower moving objects uh, and, it, and the map that, that 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 you noted was was it 90 high night i mean the Low 90s, so, right? No, it was like, like, like we got like uh, 93, like, let me just go back. So like, yeah, really this small, was like, I couldn't read it. yeah, pretty 93, pretty small. Yeah. So I would say, well, again, uh, this was like, was more of a pragmatic approach to hack something, which sounds like a feasible solution and try things rather than spending days and nights tuning parameters and get 99 per eight. Uh, like as I'm a pra like practical person, I worked a lot in practical industry projects. This can be solved when you don't have a feasible pragmatic solution. That cannot be solved, yeah, because it doesn't work out. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this was like the so focus. Right. Right. Uh, Christian, uh, I I think the the challenge is if someone stops in the street, your camera can't see them. That's the issue because if there's no movement at all, someone's invisible. So it stops on the street, but basically yeah, you could like, be, if, like if you were to just um, be in the street and fall over, you would not be detected. So but, edges, you fall, but, but you fall. You said like the prior step, you fall. 
Yeah. yeah. So okay. Yeah. So, so you, you fall. So some you history have, of the system. So it's tracking people. Okay. So as as like really nice uh, with the depiction of you, you know, like the space time, you know. I wanted to put that slide as well. Basically, you can unfold in 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 time as well how this pixels actually moved yeah, and when it, they actually increased the velocity and so on. We we actually played a lot with optic flow and so on and direction of motion, but that's a different story. But a good point, yeah. So, but again, solution as our competitor said. We can jointly add a second camera and then fuse, or use a Davis sensor, which is a hybrid RGB plus event-based single monolithic chip, self-sold by Innovation as well. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions for Christian? Yeah. Yes. Hi. We have some que one question. Uh, yes, firstly, congratulations for the work. It was a really amazing project. Really interesting, all the approach you used there. And I ju just want to ask some question about the validation metrics, because the output of your algorithm is not uh, the bounding boxes as the traditional object detectors. And generally, we use the MAP as a validation metric that consider those boxes. In your case, where we are predicting some segmentation points, as I understood, is it possible to compare the metrics you use in this case with the MAP we use in general object detection? Okay, it's a very good question. Thanks a lot. So basically, we we'll look at like maximizing the likelihood of belonging to one of the three segments. So if this like maximizing the likelihood uh, fits, I would say this is how we actually measure. So maximizing the likelihood of the events belonging to one of the three segments of the person. Yeah, three, as mentioned, why? Because we also have like different heights of the person and we have kids. And um, I, I would say, if you look at traditional machine learning, yeah, we didn't use the MAP, yeah? So we actually have this membership or like this likelihood measurements. But again, you know, I we did this just to make sure the two approaches we developed in parallel are consistent with each other, yeah? Because they're purely event-based, it's not like you did or we did it with the SNN to frame things, but it's like literally each event has a contribution to the estimate. Yeah. So in order to do that, to compare the two approaches also for us, we just use these likelihoods and then the accuracy at the end of having the events assigned to the correct person or a correct body part of the person. Good. Okay. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, next team up is Leopard Imaging. I'm very happy to uh, present this uh, uh, on behalf of our team. Um, we are from uh, Leopard Imaging. My name is Leon. Our team members are like uh, Cliff Chang, uh, Zhou Jie, Yunlong, uh, Zhao Yong, Adrian, Natalie, Eric, Leon, myself. So you see that um, this is a pretty big team. Um, I want to give some information about uh, us, um, why we join this like a uh, contest um one reason is that uh, actually recently uh, we are developing a product using the sony's uh, imx 500 uh, sensor and this is a good fit for this project the other reason is that uh, uh, once we learn that this is uh, this contest is about uh, reducing the accidents um, increase the safety of the city um, and I see that there's a, a lot of numbers of uh, fatality every year. So we see that this is a very uh, meaningful project. It can help a lot of people uh, improve their life. So yeah, that's why we jump in and then uh, form a team quickly uh, and uh, have a propose and have some uh, solutions. So um, today I'm talking about uh, the a long list here. Um, I will skip uh, many of the detail about uh, technical things, but if you have questions, uh, you are welcome to ask me. Um, again, this is like, a, we are uh, a company that actually building uh, cameras. Um, so what we propose is actually a total solution uh, from spec to the uh, production and to uh, products, uh, including all the aspects, maintenance, uh, installation. Um, I will have the, some detailed pages later on. 
Um, uh, first page as introduction of our company. Uh, so we have like uh, we are founded uh, in two thousand eight, actually local in Fremont, very close to San Jose City. Um, we have fifteen years of uh, research engineering ex expertise. Um, uh, the good thing about us like this one uh, one stop shop. We can like uh, get the spec from our customers. We can discuss uh, the requirements uh, with them, and then uh, we start the design. Uh, and then have a, a POC, a prototype, and do a lot of validation, and then go into production from small volume to high volume. Uh, we have uh, everything uh, in house, um, and also uh, we we are in Silicon Valley. Uh, again, our expertise in uh, cameras and AI cameras. Uh, we have uh, manufactured in US and offshore. Um, yeah, this is our vision and mission. So, yeah, this is a, a, our project the description, our understanding of this project. It's actually part of the smart city. Uh, we see that there's like uh, uh, opportunities uh, there, of course, like the business opportunities and technology opportunities. Um, marketing wise, you can see that uh, uh, for this uh, smart city uh, solution, it's like about 14.9% compound average growth rate. Uh, this is a very good business. Um, on the other end, actually, we see that uh, in this market, it's adopting a lot, a lot of new technologies, uh, like the one we mentioned just now, the event sensor, and also the one we are gonna use is the uh, Sony's IMX500, which is a, a on chip, a CMOS sensor with a neural network on chip. And this is the first one, I believe. Um, of course, uh, for this market, there's a lot of uh, challenges. Um, one is like the uh, camera size um, and then power consumption because it's an edge device and we are going to install a million of this if, if possible, for example. Um, and also since it's an edge device, um, and now there's a, a lot of requirements for uh, object detection, recognition. Um, there's a, a because the model is pretty big, and how to fit this model into a small device? It's very challenging. Um, and also, if um, we want to communicate the image from the the edge device to the cloud, the bandwidth is very high. Um, so to tackle these challenges, um, we propose a solution uh, we call it Dolphin. Um, so th th it's a based on a very advanced AI sensor. This sensor uh, has the image sensor as well as the on-chip uh, neural network. Um, together with our uh, expertise from uh, design uh, to manufacturing, testing, validation, um, and with the most advanced AI models, we see that this is a good solution uh, for this problem. Um, so you, you see that uh, the, we'll talk about the performance, maintenance, and uh, uh, other things in other slides. Um, but this this solution, we see that um, this since it's a single chip, um, it built in the image sensor as well as a neural network. So it, the cost will be low and the maintenance will be low as well um, because there's not many uh, components. And also, um, actually, we talk about um, the, uh, when we talk about the cost, uh, actually, I have a slide um, in detail. Uh, here's the bomb cost and estimate cost. <clears throat> First of all, uh, on this table, um, there are, I want to explain several things. Um, first, when we talk about bomb cost, uh, we have to keep in mind it's uh, based on the uh, volume. The higher volume, you get the lower unit cost. So this bomb cost is based on a, about a thousand unit. So um, if, for example, if I like, uh, place an order for a thousand unit, then we can go to the, the vendor saying, okay, I want to have a thousand unit of this. So the you, uh, each price of, of each component uh, will be this and that. But if, for example, we uh, place order like 5,000 or 10,000, even 1 million, uh, the price will be a huge difference. 
One example would be, for example, if you go to a DigiKey, uh, you look at the price, um, a volume price is only about a third of the uh, um, detail uh, retail price. So that, that's just an example. So for this example, we assume that it's uh, based on a thousand units and we listed all the components uh, there. And of course, uh, when we have this uh, proposed design, uh, we have uh, several options. Um, these options is actually based on what uh, we really need uh, in the field. Uh, for example, we have uh, a network. Do we really need a LTE based or we just use a mesh network? Uh, so the price is different. Um, and also we added a uh, option just like self cleaning lens. Um, this like uh, uh, it's uh, uh, what we propose that uh, for uh, reduce the maintenance because like for anything happen to the lens, for example, there's a dust, there's dirt, or like snow, or uh, or uh, there's water, or even uh, some like a bird poo or something. Um, we need to like a clean lens if. Since this camera is mounted very high, um, it's very hard to clean the lens to climb that high, or the or the cost is very high. So we use a self clean lens, um, use ultrasound, um, have vibration. Um, this is this new technology. We work with uh, uh, our partner um, to have a this solution. Um, so you see that the uh, the bomb cost, the unit cost uh, listed there. The lowest one is about three hundred sixteen dollars. Um, this one is the basic version uh, with the regular lens. So if we go with like a self cleaning lens, then about a hundred dollars more. So uh, you see that uh, there are like uh, these uh, different options. Um, yeah. So uh, next, I'm going to talk about data set. Uh, before I talk about data set. Um, Maybe it's better I talk about the model first, but uh, since it's, the, the this is right here, so we'll talk about it. So again, um, the model we are using is a YOLO V8N, uh, and the data set uh, we are using is uh, uh, it's an open data set there. Actually, there are many uh, data set available on a net uh, network. Uh, for example, this is a Coco uh, data set. It's a very famous one. Uh, total number is about uh, 330,000 images. And of course, there's uh, many others, like for example, Ignet, there are like 14 million uh, images. Um, what what we do is like, uh, because like uh, the sensor itself, it's actually a um, RGB sensor. Uh, the, the only difference is the sensor built in uh, neural network. So we can use a lot of existing data sets. Um, Data set is actually a super important for a uh, algorithm, uh, for a solution. Um, we can put it this way for a model, for example, a YOLO V8 or YOLO V2, V3. Uh, it's the uh, framework or it's the body of this, uh, uh, this solution. Uh, it sets the capability of this, but the performance wise, actually we need a lot of data, data to train uh, this model uh, to get output uh, of this model and the, the more of the data set and the better quality of the data set, it will give, give us uh, more like accuracy uh, results. So we use the existing data set. And then because like, we only want to detect, uh, uh, in our case, now we choose like pedestrian, bicyclist, and scooters. Um, we just filter out all other objects. Uh, use some scripts to get the data from this data set and to create a data set for uh, this project. Uh, the data set we are using consists of uh, uh, 85,000 images. Um, actually, honestly, um, it, it can be improved. It can be better if you are, if we have more time. Um, one way we can get more pictures like to get uh, to approach to uh, other uh, open data sets. The other thing we can do is like actually um, we can capture the video from uh, uh, street uh, 
live stream cameras. And then from the camera, from the video, we can extract the image and then label the image. So uh, with this data set, um, uh, we get some, I will show our uh, result la uh, later on. Uh, but I, what I'm saying like uh, if in the future, uh, we will have like higher, uh, better data set and we can even higher a uh, performance. Um, also, I want to mention that uh, our solution, actually, we also think that um, actually we could do the uh, training uh, after we install the camera, because uh, it, it's actually, this is a good way to train uh, the, the camera. So we, we use the uh, very real image and then uh, accumulate over time so that we can cover different weather, for example, like a uh, so, uh, snowing or winter time very dark image in nighttime. So we get more images from the real scene and then we can um, do the training um, and then update the model in the camera so that you can improve. Um, the model we use is a YOLO V8. Uh, you only look once. This is a very famous uh, object detection model. Um, and YOLO V8 is the latest one is a state of art model. I think it's just came out early this year. Um, it has the highest uh, accuracy and the highest speed overall. Um, when we cho choose this uh, model, actually we compare other models uh, like uh, uh, MobileNet SSD, uh, faster R, CNN, um, but we, we look at all the, so our criteria is like the speed, uh, the accuracy and the uh, size of the model. So eventually we choose a yellow VO, VAN. Um, of course, like it's very challenging to put this model into uh, this, this uh, sensor. Um, so we put a lot of effort there and working uh, uh, with Sony as well. They, they have very, very good uh, SDK and they have a very good tool to do the quantization. Um, and the tool and the SDK is uh, still updating and they have a good team to work on that. So um, we use this uh, most advanced uh, um, model. And um, one of the uh, challenges we, we ran into is like uh, the, we use like YOLO VAN, the nano version. It's, there are 3.2 million parameters. Um, without quantization, it's about 12 megabyte. Uh, it would not fit in the um, in the uh, sensor. Um, so we have to do quantization. Quantization, quantization means uh, we're using lower bits, for example, eight bits to represent the parameters, which is usually, usually in uh, float uh, in a flow format, which is like four bytes. So we have to reduce the uh, uh, footprint from like 12 meg to three meg. And we not, uh, cannot lose a lot of uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, so yeah, this is what I'm talking about. Um, this quantization, we spend a lot of time, a lot of time um, tuning the quantization, uh, optimize uh, the algorithm um, so that eventually uh, uh, we finished this uh, together with help from like uh, Sony's team um, and it worked very well. Uh, this quantization, let me see if I have the uh, yeah, performance evaluation. Right, um, sorry, I, I don't have the result uh, from uh, comparing before quantization, after quantization, but uh, um, it's very, very, very close. And the result I show here uh, is the uh, actually actually the uh, the real performance of the uh, camera. Um, so this is like a accuracy wise uh, pedestrian, bicyclist, and scooter. Um, this is the uh, MAP. Um, again, the MAP is the uh, mean um, average precision, uh, which means like for example, if I detect uh, five uh, five objects uh, and four of them are correct, for example, and then it's 80%. So it's 
close to one, that means like a better performance. Um, for a bicyclist and scooter, we get a pretty high accuracy. Uh, and But for pedestrian, um, you see that it's uh, pretty low. I think uh, one of that, it's, it's not very low, I mean, <laughs> compared to um, Coco data set, if you see the uh, accuracy overall, it's actually pretty good. Um, of course, like I hope to get to a higher number. Uh, I think one of that is like the data set we choose. Um, we can, once we have like more images and more data set, uh, we can get a uh, higher uh, percentage, um, higher accuracy. Uh, on the other hand, because uh, the pedestrian and bicyclists and scooters, they are uh, physically, they are very close. Uh, you can consider, for example, some person stand up uh, on a scooter. It could be a pedestrian because like, it's very hard to differentiate this. But for, I mean, uh, for the meaning of the accuracy, um, it's actually uh, to um, to serve the purpose of like our customer how we use this camera. So if we can tell um, how many people uh, in the scene, then that's good. Sometimes we cannot differentiate from like scooters or pedestrians um, or bicyclists, but we know there are some uh, people in the field. Um, of course, like after more training, it can be uh, better. Um, so this is some of the result. Uh, we see that uh, there, there's some, you see uh, very clearly detecting a lot of people. Uh, of course, there's some uh, missing and uh, uh, false positive as well. Um, and you see that the uh, bicycle list we can detect and the scooter we can detect. Um, so here's the, from the image you can tell uh, scooters and the pedestrians, they are very close. So it, it's sometimes it's very hard to differentiate. Um, for installation and uh, maintenance, actually we consider a lot of things uh, for this. Uh, for example, our design will be like a uh, better proof. Um, of course, right now it's, we are using the uh, evaluation kit for software development. Uh, but eventually the product will be uh, weatherproof and we use a self-cleaning lens uh, to reduce the maintenance. Also, um, we can remote update the camera and remote uh, diagnose, diagnose of the camera um, so that we know if anything happened to the camera, um, then we can like either like uh, reboot it or uh, get an error message. We can uh, update the firmware software um, so everything is from remote. This is like uh, make the solutions low maintenance and low, low maintenance means low cost. Um, and installation, we like to install uh, on top of the pole. Um, and um, for, for this installation, actually, um, let me find another page. Okay, I, I'll talk about uh, the technology we use there because this is pretty high. And uh, for the neural network, the resolution we use is only 288 by 288. Uh, how we solve this like a problem, like the, the object that is physically very small, how are we gonna detect that? Um, this is the AI software architecture. Um, it's very straightforward. So because uh, we have this uh, neural network building the sensor. Um, so everything inside the sensor, um, the output is like DN, like uh, tensors, as well as high resolution raw image. Uh, as I mentioned, the neural network, uh, the resolution is uh, low. Uh, to display this image, we need a high resolution. Um, but uh, in many cases, actually, we don't really need to display it. For the display, it is for for now for debugging purposes or for this monitor purposes. The the end product, the real product, we actually we not really need the dis display. Everything is uh, uh, we just need the result from uh, this camera. So we 
have the post processing and then uh, we have a counting and we have an information hub. So this one either display the image on the screen or it can like transmit the data to the cloud um, through like a network LTE or like a serial port. Uh, power consumption, uh, this is estimation um, because like uh, now we all, we have the only have the proof of concept uh, development kit uh, working. Uh, we don't have the uh, real products yet, but uh, this is uh, based on some estimation. Um, so we, you see that the, we use like two numbers. One is average number, one is peak number. Um, of course, this processor we choose from is a NXP is a MX8. Um, it has like a, some processing power and flexible enough. And it's a, so the average is about a little bit over two watts. Mm, <clears throat> and we can choose other processes as well. So uh, it's possible that uh, uh, we can reduce it further. Um, response time estimate. Um, the speed um, is about uh, six to seven frames per second. So we, we see that uh, there are some latencies. Uh, one latency is from image capture. Uh, the, the image is running at 30 frames per second, which means it's like a 33 millisecond. And the process time is about 134 milliseconds, actually a little bit less than that. So in total is about uh, six, 160 millisecond. It's about uh, six to seven frames per second. Um, this is like uh, uh, the neural network plus image processing. So if you want to uh, send the result to the cloud and uh, from the cloud to the center, so we need to add some more time about like, for example, 20 millisecond for, but it, overall it, it's less than one second uh, for most advanced use cases. So we see that it's about uh, several hundred uh, milliseconds. Um, <clears throat> here's the one thing I want to mention, uh, several things I want to mention in our uh, proposed design. Um, so we use the most advanced model, YOLO VAN, and then this model, and we do a lot of uh, optimization, quantization, and to fit uh, this into this uh, MX500 sensor. Um, and also we have proposed this like self-cleaning lens design. So it reduced the uh, maintenance. Um, and to reduce, to achieve high performance, uh, I, I have a show one solution here is that we use like large field of view um, lens. So that we can cover this area the whole area, uh, but since the sensor, the neural network itself is only like a 288 by 288, uh, which means this object, if we use all the field of view, the object will be uh, very small uh, and small enough then you may not be able to detect it. So our solution is uh, we will like scan, we will set some region of interest then we will scan this area um, because this uh, this sensor and the neural neural network they stay together, so it's very easy to configure the sensor to uh, stream uh, our eyes, a uh, re region of interest. So we will stream this one um, to the neural network, and we get result of this area, and then this area, this area, this area. So in this example, I set like uh, you know, five areas, and since we have like about six frames per second. Um, so even with this scan mode, we can finish within one second. So this is like some, um, <clears throat> some, uh, some uh, proposed uh, solutions. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, everyone. Uh, uh, thank you judges. Thank you uh, and uh, thank our audience. Um, again, I want to mention this uh, project uh, is very meaningful. Um, that's why we put some uh, resources in this. And you see the five words below. Actually, there's, this is our company's culture. 
um, especially the last one, Kerry. Um, so yeah, we are a group of people with a very positive and professional, and we, we would like to solve the problems and to make the world better. Okay, yeah, thank you much. That's all my presentation. Okay. Okay. Thank, thank you, Leo. Um, we have just a few minutes for questions. Uh, do the judges or any of the judges want to ask the first questions? Um, I have some questions here. Um, maybe more than a few minutes here. Um, um, you didn't talk much about nighttime performance. Can you just quickly share what you did um, in regards to nighttime performance? What, what kind of tests did you do? Right. Uh, for nighttime performance, uh, we didn't do it yet. <clears throat> um, I, but actually, we know the performance of this sensor. Um, um, so it, at like nighttime with the uh, street light, actually uh, with this sensor, it should be performing uh, pretty well. We didn't do the uh, measurement yet, but actually we designed a lot of uh, cameras. Um, we have like a thousands of camera types. And we know with this sensor at like normal street light, it's the performance is pretty good. But yes, yeah, we didn't do a test, but we, have, we are very confident. Sure. Yeah. Your cost estimate included a uh, an item for thermal camera. Obviously the Sony is not a thermal camera. How, right. How, why did you include that? Yeah, it's it's just an option. Um, okay. Yeah, it's, it's optional. Uh, we didn't, uh, it's not in the basic configuration. Um, the thermal sensing, um, it will help us in some situation like where there's no light at all, uh, you, the thermal sensor can see, so can detect. Um, yeah, it's sure. But it, then, but the then with the thermal, my my experience with thermal cameras is that they're not cheap. Right. Um, yeah. Surprised that you you know you listed here for six sixty two as an all in cost here. Um, oh. Right. The thermal yeah. camera, there are different type, and the type we are using is uh, the resolution is not that high. Okay. Um, yeah, it's only um, one sixty by one twenty resolution. Um, so the the cost is low. It, it's actually you, you can look up. It's about about I think less than a hundred dollars. Sure, this but is, then but then but then the thermal camera setup doesn't come with the built-in um, you know AI chip like like Sony does. So right, right, right. yeah, yeah, possibly yeah. something it is. different. Sure. Yeah, this is just an option. We, we don't okay. we see, see that if there's some situation there's no light at all, and we still want to detect people, then we could use the most uh, sensing technology. Okay. And then one last question. Um, you, you know, um, your your accuracy for pedestrian is relatively low. I mean, fifty three, in my opinion, is low. Yeah. One of the most fundamental metrics when it comes to uh, pedestrian detection um, is counts. Okay. We we the counts pedestrian counts uh, whether they're on uh, scooters, uh, bicyclists, whatever th they serve as our fundamental um, metric for all engineering purposes. It starts with counts, okay. Yeah. And you know, with that number fifty three being so low, um, I'm kind of worried. Um, is this just because you didn't have time to fine tune the model, or you think this is just inherent um, something that that you know that the camera that the technology can't support right now to to achieve a higher number? Um, I think based on our experience, uh, it can be really high, like the bicycle is like uh, up to like 90 or something. Um, it's a, one is like the data set, we need like more data set to train the model. Um, so what, once we have like a more data and more training, uh, it can be higher. And two is like the, the two uh, objects, pedestrian and scooter, these two objects, they are like too close. Um, so fundamentally, if like, uh, for example, if we, if we don't specify scooter as a, as a group, we just put together like scooter and pedestrian together, they, they all considered pedestrians. In that case, uh, the accuracy will be uh, much, much higher. Okay. And, and, and lastly, this is a general question actually for all three, for all three proposals so far is that, you know, do you guys find it more difficult when you're trying to um, detect or even count pedestrians when they are grouped up in a cluster, like, like crossing the uh, crossing the street. Is that a general? Yes. Yes. Um, There's it... no problem there, or like because then you basically have overlapping skeletons and you do the same thing running for the 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 matching of events to the parts of the skeleton. 
Of course, when they're like perfectly overlapping, it could be hard. But in our case, because we use this body segmentation, we will have like multiples of these segments running around, like right? these three, like two points broken sticks, you know, everywhere. But, so but, no, but, but when they're overlapped, that, that would be a problem? Yeah, but no. Why? Because we have these sticks with different, as I also put in the slides, we have like upper body, lower body, and the like uh, upper body, middle, and lower body. Basically, you have a person which has three legs, and this is not possible. So you'll have also ways mm. of discriminating. Yeah, I so see. because, oh, there's like a third leg, a third uh, lower segment. So you have to figure out that this is not a single person with three legs or. But Leon, you said uh, it is a problem, though, right? It, yeah, it is a problem, um, at least like, a, for example, for this overlap, um, mm -hmm. these two, on, we only count one. But once they separate a little bit, uh, the, the algorithm can detect it. Um, this is uh, basically just like, um, even like uh, people ourselves, if they overlap too much, we cannot like uh, differentiate that they're, they're two person. But yeah. In some cases, if there's this overlap, the, the counting uh, would be uh, misleading a little bit. I think the term for it, Kwabana can probably correct me here, but I think the term for it is occlusion. occlusion. And there's an example of it in this image that is shown on the left. There is a, I believe, lady in front of the taxi at the front left corner of the taxi, and she's not identified. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay, great. Uh, let's just do one one quick question, Leo. Somebody asked, what what size is the solar panel that you were suggesting to go on these? But of course, you would also have to have a battery storage to go with that. But uh, right in uh, terms of uh, wattage, yeah, they were just yes. curious. Yeah, since the the overall it's about two watts, so as long as it can supply like more than like a two watts or maybe three for what that should be more than enough. And if we like install a battery, um, that uh, will be helpful. Okay, okay, great. Thank you, Leo. Let's uh, move on to the next the, and the final Thank you. team. Team Akule, please. Yes, Team Oculi. Oculi, sorry, <laughs> yes. All right, so. Hi, everyone, and thank you for sticking around for the last presentation. My colleague Adam here and I are current undergraduate mechatronics engineering students, and we are excited to share with you the solution that we were able to uh, come to um, in the context of our internship at Oculi. All right, so for our agenda for the day, we'll introduce our project and its main components. Before diving deeper into the data set, its choice and how we included the Oculi SPU in increasing the size of the data set and improving the results by generating regions of interest, which are ROIs. Then we'll discuss the model architecture that we use before then uh, highlighting some results and evaluating the performance of our system. All right, so the main goal behind our pedestrian detection model is for it to be robust to geographical and meteorological variations. So we saw with the previous teams that this was a significant problem so for example, we have daytime and nighttime changes. We have weather conditions that might intervene. So we wanted to uh, contribute mainly to this challenge by making sure that we can account for these different changes. Another thing is that the data set that we use contained 2000 plus images that vary in these conditions and that feature multiple pedestrians. They vary in size, they vary in category and the different frames that we have. These data, these images come from two open source data sets, which are the LLVIP low light vision data set, as well as the NTU pedestrian data sets, so that we are able to account for these different cases. And what we did is that we incorporated the Oculi SPU in our solution to generate ROIs from these frames. So we're not processing all the pixels and all the uh, regions of the images. This allowed us to optimize the model performance. And the model that helped us achieve that is the mobile net a model that was available on Edge Impulse. And uh, we'll discuss later on the comparison that we did between using standard images and working with ROIs, which allowed us to achieve a 37% increase in accuracy, as well as a 97% uh, 
decrease in interference time when simulating on edge inputs. So what is Oculus SPU and what made its incorporation in our project that significant? Oculus SPU is the only software-defined vision sensor. It provides real-time vision intelligence with sensing and pre-processing at the pixel level. While most conventional event-based sensors are based on only on uh, the motion, the SPU uh, can uh, output static objects based on their pixel characteristics and highlight specific regions in the frame. Uh, we need to highlight that all this is done on the chip level without the requirement for an extra microprocessor. So uh, some of the characteristics that made Oculus SPU contribute positively to the results are its ability uh, to uh, cap capture fast moving objects in the frame. This comes with fast computations and low latency. Uh, although the computation is done fast, a low bandwidth is achieved and all relevant data are being secured. Now, Oculus SPU is compatible with a standard AI model. This helped us in uh, our project to uh, detect pedestrians from the generated ROIs. Oculus SPU as well manages extreme lighting, which made it more suitable for the proposed problem to cover various, ch various changes in the lighting conditions. Uh, moreover, Oculus SPU uh, is, uh, software, uh, has a software-defined architecture uh, which means that the software can be programmed for different scenarios to capture different targets. This is attained through the control of the smart events and the actionable signals. Uh, Oculus SPU doesn't only capture uh, different targets, but it also provides numbers and statistics about those targets and their type. And now, since we are building a tiny ML model, uh, the Oculus SPU is ideal when it comes to its size, weight, and power consumption, with, which is in the milliwatt range uh, and is proportional to the ROI size. Uh, after discussing some of the characteristics uh, of the Oculus SPU, we needed to find a data set out of which we could generate ROIs. The data that uh, need uh, the data that needs uh, we needed to find needs to account for the requirements by the tiny ML, which are basically the lighting, the elevation, and the surrounding. So few open source data sets uh, verify this criteria. Out of which we chose the LLVIP, which is a visible infrared per data set for low light vision, and the NTU pedestrian data set. Why did we choose these two data sets? Basically, the NTU data pedestrian data set has daylight data with various sizes of pedestrians, meaning that we can detect uh, pedestrians that are close to the camera lens and away from it. And the LLVIP uh, data set has data from suitable elevations, various lighting conditions, and diverse representation of pedestrians, including cyclists, children, and uh, pedestrians with different ages. Uh, after choosing our data set, we needed uh, to find a proper solution to, div to diversify the selected data and identify all people present in the frames, no matter the lighting conditions or the setting they are presented in. Here comes the role of Oculus SPU in our project. We generated ROIs from the full frame data samples from both the LLVIP and the NTU data sets. So how was this done? We took the uh, output of Oculus SPU and uh, did some processing on that to generate bounding boxes. These bounding boxes are now the potential uh, regions of interest. Uh, these bounding boxes are further subjected to some processing. Um, and to make sure that our results are accurate, we needed to take a feedback response from the previous frame. OK, in this video, you can see uh, it is taken from the uh, NTU data set. Uh, the ROI is being updated, updated with the movement of the pedestrian, and we need to note that the ROI is taking place at the uh, chip level. Uh, the SPU can reach a maximum speed of 33,000 um, uh, frames per second uh, for smart events and 714 hertz for full, uh, for full frames. This is a video taken from the LLVIP, and we can see the comparison between the small ROI that is being fed to the uh, model and the full frame that is being fed to the model, which explains why our results were more accurate. And we can also see that we have a different uh, difference in lighting conditions. And this video, uh, this video is taken from the NTU data set, and we can see the detection of the SPU uh, for pedestrians that are not moving in the frame. 
uh, one standing, which covers some limitations by most co uh, conventional vision sensors. All right. Now, regarding the model that we used to achieve these results, Edge Impulse was our main platform of experimentation. And what we did is that we used its embedded Euro V5 labeling tool to label these images that we have. The images that we used, as my colleague Adam mentioned, are so, so the images that we used are mainly in two categories divided. So we, we have the complete images from the data sets that we used, which are the full frames. We fed those to our edge impulse model and we tested the, the, uh, the performance of the object data, the pedestrian detection model. Then what we did to show the significant improvement that the ocular SPU can bring in, we, we took the ROI images that were generated by the ocular SPU as explained uh, just before, and we fed them as well to the same model, and we saw the significant improvement in the results, which will be explained in a few. So, okay, so the differences between processing 500 by 500 full frames compared to 78 by 78 ROIs. And experimentation with different tiny ML models on the platform let us to use the full mobile VNet model, which provides the right trade off between accuracy, speed, and memory, and which is a valued component of the project, as well as predicts the object center instead of the bounding box, which helps us account for different errors that might sometimes occur when uh, in labeling. All right, so here we can see some preliminary results. And on the left, we have full frames, which are the complete images. Here they are cropped just for visualization purposes. And on the top, we see here that we have two people labeled. And the model is only detecting one of them in the uh, result that comes below it. To account for this problem and to account for incorrect and misdetections, we can feed the model, not the full frames, but the ROIs. And we can see here clearly the two people are detected and the model can detect them easily at the first try without extra fine tuning. Now let's talk, in, let's talk about our results even more. On the left, we have another sample where we have two pedestrians detected. And here we can see that when we feed the model these extra pixels that surround them, we sometimes end up with incorrect uh, detections. So here we have, for example, two labels for people where, whereas there is none. And the uh, pedestrian that is on top of uh, the one in the green jacket is not detected on the right. So we need to account for these limitations. And this is what uh, we were able to do in our project. So when we feed the model the smaller image, which is the ROI, we can label the images clear in a clearer manner. And we are able to detect them even if the accuracy seemed low, but it is an important contribution and it is significant to know that this would, this would not have been uh, achieved, achievable with uh, other types of images. All right, so here is another example. And here we can see that for all these samples, the lighting conditions are dark and somewhat extreme. So the most open source data sets do not feature such uh, variations in lighting condition. And here we can see that the pedestrians are relatively small, so uh, this is where the uh, elevation criteria can be checked in our project. So here on the top, we have the label, uh, the labeled images that, that we feed to the, to the model. And we see here that one of the pedestrians is not detected. So this missed detection comes also with another detection that is incorrect. So here we have two circles signifying that the model is detecting two people instead of one, which is here the cyclist. So when we feed the model, these individual and smaller images where each pedestrian is uh, identified and uh, kind of cropped out in, in their own image, in their own ROI, we are able to correctly detect and identify these people, which helps us to kind of be able to count all the pedestrians present in frame, whether they are moving, whether they aren't, and what, uh, no matter their here is another sample where we have uh, brighter uh, lighting settings. And here we can see that here, even if the pedestrians are clearly labeled and can be clearly identified by us humans, the model is not detecting them even after fine tuning. And this can be solved when we send the model, the ROI for it to be trained on and for it to detect the pedestrian. So here we are able to detect it when we send even a slightly smaller image to it. This last sample here also highlights this point even more. 
So here we can see that the people are clearly detected, so no elevation or lighting condition intervened, but the model sometimes is prone to errors and requires further training. But regardless, by working with ROIs and by making sure that we are removing these uh, pixels that are not uh, needed for processing and that might, um, furthermore, when training, the noise might be introduced. So when we isolate these pedestrians, we are able to detect them and we are able to achieve higher detection confidence with the ROIs. So here our results are mapped out uh, in a clearer manner. And here uh, the platform that allowed us to get them was training on edge impulse. So as I said, we had two projects that we worked with. One was for the full frame data and one was for these smaller images, these ROI data. And when testing and training on the platform, we were able to decrease the uh, inference time significantly, as well as increase the training and testing accuracies and uh, decrease the RAM usage, which here is a kind of, it models the performance of the model on when deployed on uh, a microprocessor such as the Raspberry Pi, for example. So here we reached, for example, 84% for training, 81% for testing, as well as a uh, drastic drop of the inference time from 69 to two milliseconds for the object detection. Here our results are summarized even more. So when switching from working with standard full frame based methods, we are able to, to working with the ROIs, uh, with the help of the Ocular SPU, we are able to achieve these significant results, which include 37% more accuracy, 97% faster response and lower inference time, as well as 97% storage state. Now for future work, the problem is heavily reliant on data. So uh, we call for more data collection, of course, and improving the model performance. And this can be done by incorporating the SPU in such applications because it has also more uh, areas to more, uh, more benefits that it can provide for us to build safer and more robust applications such as the pedestrian detection case. Thank you, and we are open for questions. Okay, do uh, any of the judges want to lead with some questions? Let me ask a basic question here. I'm I'm trying um having a hard time trying to understand what the uh Oakley 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 SPU actually does. Okay, it basically um uh does some processing at the pixel level of each image and uh, gives outputs based on the intensity values of those pixels. So it's a smart programmable vision sensor. So it's not a, an event-based sensor. It's more, it, it, it has more flexibility in it. And uh, has, it comes with, uh, you know, SDK and uh, a GUI and a platform with more flexibility for the user. So, so, so the output from the Alkali uh, SPU are those ROIs? those right it's the element that allows us to process these images and get the smaller ones which help us more in the uh, pedestrian detection basically every video that has been shown uh the ROIs built are directly taken from the SPU without even having the need for another microprocessor for processing mm, okay so no extra component would be needed in the, the uh, in the uh, realization of the solution Okay, and 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 by doing and by um, capturing these these RRIs from a larger frame, you're able to increase the the um the the accuracy of these models. Yes, because okay. the model, uh, so in the requirements of the problem and the problem statement, so uh, position the need to capture pedestrians at higher elevation pushed us to get to this point where we need to find a way to force the model to act better and force it to uh, correctly identify the pedestrians, no matter where they are uh, shown, whether close or far from the camera. So this was the motivation. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's very interesting, thank you. Where did the actual processing happen? Because I didn't actually get it, because you said use edge impulse and ran the whole ROE fed model on? Yes, all right, let me elaborate on that. So what we do is that we transition from the full frame, which, has the, which are the complete images, to the ROIs. We do that using the Oculi SPU. 
But since we, as uh, as interns, let me uh, highlight that even more. What we did is that we uh, worked with Edge Impulse in order to perform the model detection. So, so we get the smaller images by using the Ocula SPU and its outputs, and we fine tune these images and we generate the bounding boxes by the, by using uh, the Ocula SPU. But then all and the reason where does the model run? On Edge Impulse, as I said. Ah, okay. So it's yeah. basically it's okay. So, 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 is this something that you you can actually install on in the field, or is this still very much in the lab here? Environment? Yes. So, I mean, Edge Impulse already has the option to deploy the models that we develop, and with all the fine tuning that we do to them to increase the accuracy, and so the parameters that we fix on the platform, we can we have the option to deploy them and uh, and use the model directly from there. So, what are the uh, I think Sorry, the, the, the question is the so edge impulse. Okay, you can run it uh, on the edge impulse side algorithm, but that sits on the some cloud or the the working with a laptop or whatever. Uh, what actual camera which can run the algorithm in the field? That's the question. Yeah. All right. So, okay, let me rephrase myself. So, edge impulse was only the tool that we as interns used to be able to visualize how the uh, performance and the accuracy improves when working with the ROIs. We never said that, you know, uh, the, we tested the, we tested it on the SPU itself. All right, so uh, Edge Impulse already has the option on the platform. So if you go to it, it was shared with, by some of our, by some of the teams here, uh, it has the option to deploy the model. So we have, we get like, uh, you can choose which, uh, for example, which programming language you want it to be, or which sensor you want it to be compatible with, to to work with it. Okay, thank you. So just to confirm, so the this is not specified in this proposal, uh, but it, it could be the choice of the hardware um, for that deployment. Correct. Yes, but the hardware itself that we we are. We did not work with, but mm -hmm. we are proposing is the Ocula SPU itself. So that chip where the processing will actually take place. Gotcha. Thank you. Welcome. I have a question. Yes. Uh, as I could understand, the right technique, it basically it's able to smartly create regions around the possible interest objects, and then you send an amount reduced of data to the algorithm instead of the full frame, right? Exactly. Yeah. But for example, in most of the crossroads in a high altitude, you have, for example, pedestrians everywhere in the image. They're having every corner of her pixels. And did you test how the, the ROI would work in such dense scenarios? Because for example, the event-based cameras, they will just focus on the moving object objects and send data for other pixels, but focusing only on the interest objects. And how Roy would react in such dense scenarios? Would Roy work well as well? Yes, so when we have a frame with multiple pedestrians on it in different areas and different sizes, so we need to account for all of them. We need for the model to be able to detect all of them. So this is what we are actually saying here. So by using this ROI generation technique, we are able to identify these pedestrians and capture them individually and send images to the model where these pedestrians are shown in a clearer ma manner. So do you get multiple, I'm sorry, do you get multiple ROIs? Uh, yes. If there's, so if there's like six or eight clusters of pedestrians, you would get six or eight ROIs? Or does your ROI just become the full frame? No. So, if, for example, if pedestrians are very close to each other, they two pedestrians, let's say, they can be sent in one ROI. But this way, the model would uh, automatically be able to detect them since they are shown clearly. But for other pedestrians, the, the, the same case applies. And this is done not just by basing ourselves on motion tests. So comparing frames, we can do, we can, the Oculi SPU has other outputs 
So uh, Adam showed previously a video where one of the pedestrians was not moving and it was still captured by this ROI around it. So by making use of all these outputs, we are able to account for these different cases and uh, identify these pedestrians no matter they are in frame and no matter how many of them there are. I just want to highlight a small thing that the SPU uh, has a software defined architecture, meaning that we can control the, uh, if we want like two pedestrians to be in the same ROI, or to define that these two pedestrians that are close to each other be in different ROIs. Yeah, so this all comes to, to experimentation and you know further working with the problem and assessing the requirements and what is optimal. So, so you don't propose a uh, a sample, you know, um, bomb or cost estimate. So it's kind of hard for me to assess the scale of. Um, complexity when it comes to fuel insulation, you know, or costs. We did not actually reach that point yet because, as I mentioned, you know, we're interns. We don't necessarily have access to all the technology and all the confidential information related to that. But what we do know is that, and what we did work on, and which, you know, we are proud of this contribution because this was all a learning experience for us. It's just the improvements in the result that can be incorporated with any uh, other solution, you know, and uh, if we have these uh, drastic uh, performance improvement in our solution, then it does not matter how it is implemented, but the Ocula SPU itself is the chip that can, that is able to uh, to do all of that. We, we thank all the teams for their great presentations. I think we learned a lot this morning, so thank you. Um, and a reminder, on Thursday morning at uh, 8 a.m. Pacific, uh, we will have uh, Matt Mahon, the mayor of San Jose, uh, do the award ceremony. Uh, the judges will meet shortly and determine the rankings, and then uh, the mayor will announce them. Uh, we'll do brief overviews and and then hand out the awards on Thursday. So please take a minute, snap the QR code, uh, sign up to have the Zoom link to attend. And we'll also send out email to everybody. But uh, if you take a minute and sign up, then you can join us to hear the winners. I want to thank everybody for their great contributions. I think we moved uh, this problem quite a ways forward in terms of solutions. Then I would like to take a minute to thank once again all the sponsors of the Tiny ML Foundation and our strategic partners help make this and all our events uh, possible. Our executive strategic partners are uh, Qualcomm AI Research, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous, Sentient, accelerating your edge compute, making edge AI a reality, our platinum strategic partners, uh, Sony Atrios, to deploy vision AI at the edge at scale. Our gold strategic partners, analog devices um, ahead of what's possible. Arduino, easily de deploy your tiny ML solutions with Arduino Pro. Build the future of tiny ML on ARM. Edge Impulse, the leading development platform for Edge ML. Infineon, um, driving decarbonization and digitalization together. Inetera, neuromorphic intelligence for the sensor edge. Renaissance, enabling um, the revolution and the next generation of AI powered solutions revolutionizing every industry sector. ST uh, Life Augmented. Synaptics Engineering Exceptional Experiences. And our silver strategic partners uh, AI Zip, Arduino, Brainchip, Efficient, Greenwaves, Gravity. IMAX, Imagimob, Noda, AI, NXP, Procter & Gamble, PMIC, PolyN Technology, Schneider Electric, Sensa Mel, Silicon Labs, and TDK. 
So I want to thank everybody. And I want to thank everybody for attending. And I want to thank all the contestants for participating in the hackathon. We look forward to seeing everybody on Thursday at 8 a.m. Pacific when we will announce the results. Wish everybody a good rest of their day.